Good morning. Uh, well, at least for me, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. As Maddie said, I'm Emily Freeman. I'm the author of DevOps for Dummies and the curator of 97 Things Every Cloud Engineer Should Know. I am really excited about this idea. So excited that I got up super early this morning to share it with you. I want to pitch you a complete reimagining of the SDLC. And before I even start, I want to be super clear. This has to be a community effort. I want your feedback and I want to know what you think. You can always find me on Twitter at Editing Emily. Now, most of my work centers around DevOps. I really can't overstate the sheer impact the concept of DevOps has had on this industry. In many ways, it built on the foundation of Agile to become a default, a standard that we all reach for in our everyday work. When DevOps surfaced in 2008 as an idea, the tech industry was in a vastly different space. AWS was in infancy, offering only a handful of services. Azure and GCP didn't exist yet, at least not for everyone. The majority of companies maintained their own infrastructure. Developers wrote code and relied on sysadmins to deploy new code at scheduled intervals, typically weeks, months apart. Container technology hadn't been invented. Applications adhered to a monolithic architecture. Databases were relational. Serverless wasn't a concept. Everything from the application to the engineers was centralized. Our current ecosystem couldn't be more different. Now, don't get me wrong. Software is still hard. It just is. It always will be. But we continue to find novel solutions to consistently difficult, persistent problems. Some of these end up being a bit of a rebranding of old ideas, but others are a unique and clever take to abstracting complexity or automating toil, or perhaps most important, rethinking, challenging the premises that we have accepted as canon for years, even decades. In the years since, since DevOps attempted to answer this critical conflict between developers and operations engineers, DevOps has become a catch-all term, and there have been a number of derivative works. DevOps has come to mean thousands of different things to thousands of people. For some, it can be distilled to continuous integration, CI/CD. For others, it's simply deploying code more frequently perhaps adding tests, which you should definitely do. For others still, it's organizational. They've added a platform team, even a questionably named DevOps team, or have created an engineering structure that focuses on a separation of concerns, leaving feature teams to manage the development, deployment, security, maintenance of their siloed services. Whatever the interpretation, what's important is there isn't a universally accepted standard of what DevOps is or what it looks like in execution. It's a philosophy more than anything else, a framework that people can utilize to configure and customize their specific circumstances to modern development practices. And often everyone feels they're doing it right. <laughs> The one characteristic of DevOps that I think we can all agree on is that it attempted to capture the challenges of the entire software development process. None of the derivative works have been that ambitious. They typically focus on only a segment of software delivery. It's that broad umbrella, that holistic view that I really want to breathe life back into. The challenge we face is that DevOps is an increasingly outmoded solution to a previous problem. Developers now face cultural and technical challenges far greater than how to more quickly deploy a monolithic application. Cloud Native is the future, the next collection of default development decisions. 
and one the DevOps story can't absorb in its current form. I believe the era of DevOps is waning. And in this moment, as the sun sets on DevOps, we have a truly unique opportunity to rethink, rebuild, even replatform. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. That would be mighty handy. I don't know exactly what the next decade of tech is going to look like. None of us do. I can't write this story alone. I need you. But I have some ideas that can get the conversation started. I believe that to build on what was, we have to throw away assumptions, all the things that we've taken for granted all this time. In order to move forward, we must first step back. The software or systems development life cycle, what we call the SDLC ubiquitously, has been in use since the 1960s. And it's remained more or less the same since before color television and the touch tone phone. Over the last 60 years, we've made tweaks and slight adjustments, massaged it, zhuzhed it even. The stages or steps are always a little different. With Agile, we bent it into a circle. And with DevOps, we made an infinity loop. We've added pretty colors. <laughs> But across all use cases, the SDLC has become an assumption. We don't even think about it anymore. Universally adopted constructs like the SDLC have an unspoken permanence. They feel as if they have always been and always will be. Now, I think the impact of that is even more potent if you were born after the construct was popularized. Nearly everything around us is a construct, a model, an artifact of a human idea. The chair you're sitting in, the desk you work at, the mug from which you drink coffee and sometimes other beverages. Buildings, toilets, plumbing, roads, cars, art, computers, everything. The SDLC is a remnant, an artifact of a previous era one in which software security was a physical concern and women were called computers. I think we should throw the SDLC away or more accurately, replace it. Replace it with something that better reflects the nature of our work, a linear single threaded model designed for the manufacture of material goods cannot possibly capture the distributed complexity of modern socio-technical systems. It just can't. And these two ideas aren't mutually exclusive, that the SDLC was industry-changing, valuable, and extraordinarily impactful, and that it's time for something new. I believe we're strong enough to hold these two ideas at the same time, showing respect for the past while envisioning the future. An infinity symbol is widely used to visualize the DevOps tool chain. It was a way of more or less bending the SDLC into a loop through which companies could iterate. And like the SDLC, it implies a linear flow. As in step one, you plan and create, then you develop, then you verify and test and build and on and on and on. The DevOps interpretation of the SDLC still does not allow for a pause, a pivot, a loop back as required. Now, I don't know about you. I have never had a software project go smoothly. Not in my life, no matter how small, even if I'm the only person working on it. Software development is chaos. It is a study in entropy, and it is not exactly getting more simple. The model with which we think about software development must capture the multi-threaded, non-sequential nature of our work. It should embody the roles engineers take on and the considerations they have to encounter along the way. It should build on the foundations of Agile and DevOps and represent the iterative nature of continuous innovation. When I was thinking about this and I took my time thinking about this, 
I was inspired by ideas like extreme programming and the spiral model. I wanted something that would have layers, threads, even a way of visually representing multiple processes happening in parallel. And what I settled on is the revolution model. I believe the visualization of revolution is capable of capturing the pivotal movements of any software scenario. And I'm going to dive into all the discrete elements in a moment, but I want to give you a moment to just have a first impression, to really absorb the idea. I call it revolution because, well, for one, it revolves. Its circular shape reflects the continuous and iterative nature of our work, but also because it is revolutionary. I am challenging a 60-year-old model that is embedded into our daily language. I don't expect this to be widely integrated into production workflows tomorrow. My mission in this is to challenge the status quo and create, to create a model that I think more accurately reflects the complexity of modern cloud-native software development. The revolution model is constructed of five concentric circles, describing the critical roles of software development, architecting, developing, automating, deploying, and operating. Intersecting each loop are six spokes that describe the production considerations every engineer must consider throughout their work. Testability, securability, reliability, observability, flexibility, and scalability. The considerations listed are not all encompassing. If you're thinking that, you are correct. <laughs> there are of course things not explicitly stated, but I figured if I put 20 spokes, some of us might get a little overwhelmed, myself included. You might also be wondering why operating is smaller than architecting. Is it less important? Definitely not. When I was designing this model, I looked at architecture for inspiration. The Guggenheim was one of the shapes that caught my attention with the stunning circular ramp with which many of you are probably familiar or have walked. In a perfect world, this would be three-dimensional, show layers, movement even. But any model, I believe, must maintain its meaning and integrity even in two-dimensional visualizations. And thus, one of the roles had to be the smallest and one of them, the largest. I chose operating to be in the innermost part because I think it best represents the software process. When we're architecting, we're thinking abstractly, we're dreaming, we're designing, all things are possible. We aren't constrained. As we move through the software delivery life cycle, we become more embedded in the system. Now let's dive into each element. We have long used personas as a default way to divide audiences and tailor messages to group people. Every company in the world right now seems to be repeating this mantra of developers, developers, developers. But personas have always bugged me a bit because the approach typically either oversimplifies someone's career or it needlessly complicates it. Few people fit cleanly and completely into persona-based buckets like developers and operations anymore. The lines have gotten fuzzy. On the other hand, I don't think we need to tailor messages so specifically as to call out the difference between say, a DevOps engineer and a release engineer or a security administrator versus a security engineer. But perhaps most critically, I believe personas are immutable. A persona is wholly dependent on how someone identifies themselves. It's intrinsic, not extrinsic. Their titles may change, their jobs may differ, but they're probably still selecting that same persona on that ubiquitous list we all see when registering for an event. I was a developer. I will always identify as a developer, despite doing a ton of other work in areas like DevOps and AI ops and DevRel. In my heart, that's my viewpoint. I think about problems from that perspective first. It influences my thinking and certainly my initial approach. Roles are very different. Roles are temporary and consistent 
constantly fluctuating. If I were an actress, the parts I played would be lengthy and varied, but the persona I would identify as would remain an actor, an artist. Your work isn't confined to a single set of skills. It may have been a decade ago, but not today. In any given week or sprint, you may play the role of an architect, thinking about how to design a feature or service, a developer, building out a code, fixing out a bug, an automation engineer, looking at how to improve the manual processes that we often refer to as toil, a release engineer deploying code to different environments or releasing it to customers, or an operations engineer ensuring an application functions in consistent, expected ways. And no matter what role we play, we have a number of issues to consider. The first is testability. All software systems require testing to assure architects that designs work, developers that code works, operators that infrastructure is running as expected, and engineers of all kinds that changes won't bring down the system. Testing in its many forms is what enables systems to be durable and have longevity. A system without tests is a disaster waiting to happen, which is why testability is first among equals at this particular round table. Security is everyone's responsibility, but I think few of us understand how to design and execute secure systems. I certainly struggle with this. Security incidents, for the most part, are high impact, low probability events. The really big disasters, the ones that end up on the news and get us all free credit reporting for a year, those don't happen super frequently. And thank goodness, because we know that there are endless security vulnerabilities lurking in our systems. Security is something we know we should dedicate time to, but don't, don't often make time for. And let's be honest, it's hard and complicated and kind of scary. DevSecOps, the first derivative of DevOps, asked engineers to move security left. This approach meant that security was a consideration early in the process, not something that would block a release at the last moment. This is also the consideration under which I'm putting compliance and governance. I figure all the things that you have to call a lawyer about should just live together. Now I'm being glib, but in all seriousness, These three concepts are really about risk management, identity, data, authorization. The specifics of the situation aren't really important. What the question is, is who has access to what, when, and how? And that is everyone's responsibility at every stage and in every role. Site reliability engineering, or SRE, is a discipline, a job, an approach for good reason. It is absolutely critical that applications and services work as expected most of the time. That said, availability is often described or used as a synonym for reliability, and it's not. It's a single component of it. If a system is available, the customer data is out of sync or inaccurate, the system is not reliable. Reliability has five key components, availability, latency, throughput, fidelity, and durability. Reliability may be the end result, but resiliency for me is the journey, the action that engineers can take to improve reliability. Observability is the ability to have insight into an application or a system. It's the combination of telemetry and monitoring and alerting available to engineers and leadership alike. Now there's an aspect of observability that overlaps with reliability, which is why they kind of live close together. But the purpose of observability isn't just to maintain a reliable system, though that is of course important. It's the capacity for engineers working on a system to have visibility into the inner workings of that system. The concept of observability actually originates in linear dynamic systems and is defined as how well the internal states of a system can be understood based on information about external outputs, which is fascinating. It's critical that when companies move systems to the cloud or utilize managed services, they don't lose visibility and confidence in their systems. 
The shared responsibility model of cloud storage, compute, and managed services require that engineering teams be able to quickly be alerted to, identify, and remediate issues as they arise. Flexible systems are capable of adapting to meet the ever-changing needs of the customer and the market segment. Flexible code bases absorb new code smoothly. They embody a clean separation of concerns, are partitioned into small components or classes, and are architected to enable not just the now, but the next. In flexible systems, chain dependencies are reduced or eliminated. Database schemas accommodate change well. Components communicate via standardized and well-documented application programming interface or API. When I was considering this, I went back and forth on flexibility versus maintainability. But for me, flexibility more broadly uh, encompasses these concerns. The only thing constant in our work is change. In every role we play, creating flexible solutions that will grow as the application grows is critical. Finally, scalability. Scalability refers to more than a system's ability to scale for additional load. It implies growth, a system's ability to mature and flourish over time. Scalability in the revolution model also carries the continuous innovation of a team and the byproducts of that growth. For me, scalability is the most human of the considerations. It requires each of us in our various roles to consider everyone around us, our customers who use the system and rely on its services, our colleagues, current and future, with whom we collaborate, even, honestly, our future selves. Software development is in a straight line, nor is it a perfect loop. It is an ever-changing, complex dance. There are twirls and pivots and difficult spins forward and backward. Engineers move in parallel, creating, I think, tr truly magnificent pieces of art. The issue is those moments of pure magic and artistry the moments when we are our best, most put together selves are fleeting. The prima ballerina falls in practice, sometimes during the show as well. The first chair violinist, a literal concert master, plays the wrong note. Your tests don't pass. Your code doesn't compile. Your work silently errors. It fails in production. You don't make that deadline. The PM is mad. It is chaos. It's not you. It's the computer. And here's why I think everyone gets mad and everyone gets stressed. We expect software, stunningly, to be a straight line, but it never is. It's like the progress bar our favorite internet service providers give us during outages. You'll have streaming back in eight minutes, then three hours, then two minutes, then two days. <laughs> We continue to measure progress in a straight line. Product lunches are described as red, yellow, green. Now, I appreciate the Toyota production system and how much it is discussed in DevOps circles, but we are not making cars. This isn't a checklist. And once you attach the driver's side door, it's just always there. In no production line, does attaching the door cause the catalytic converter to break? But your small change, that can bring down the whole system or slow down requests in an entirely different uh, decoupled service. I am passionate about this new model and approach because I believe it will help developers in their everyday work. Because how can we teach business leaders and product owners and scrum masters that prediction in software development and feature delivery is a bit of a fool's errand when the model we use is a straight line. Now, I don't expect this model to look exactly like it does now in six months. I would actually consider that a bit of a failure. I want your opinions and experiences to shape this. I am one person. But let's look at potentially what the revolution model could look like in practice. Imagine a post-incident review during which your team is trying to figure out what went wrong. 
what went right, and everything in between. Let's say Mike was primary on call, but poor Mike has just had a baby and he's exhausted and slept through the alarm. Jose, a developer, woke up and after stumbling to the computer in the dark, read through the alert and opened the monitoring tooling. He quickly realized the database was throwing hundreds of exceptions. Initially, Jose assumed something had been configured incorrectly. It must have been a provisioning issue. Seems right. He continued to dig into the issue while also asking others to help on Slack. Jose was able to access a graph that showed a spike in database activity and compared that to changes in the application made around the same time. Aha! Just kidding. It's never that easy. <laughs> what is? <laughs> but here's the clip. Every recent database transaction shared the same article ID. Turns out the comments on a particularly polarizing article exceeded the limits originally provisioned for DynamoDB. The immediate fix was to set the limit impossibly high until morning when the operations engineers could probably properly enable auto scaling. During the post-incident review, while talking about all of this, a few developers involved noted that they noticed there were no uniqueness constraints stored in the database. Development time was allocated during the next sprint to allow for duplicate writes. This map, this revolutionary model gives internal and external stakeholders, including customer facing non-technical colleagues, the necessary context to understand any given process. It's even more powerful when explaining delays and incidents, complex setbacks. I believe the next 10 years of tech will be focused on developer experience. How do we make development better, faster? Yes, but also more enjoyable. How do service providers abstract complexity without exaggerating simplicity or obfuscating observability? How do we innovate not just in our technology, but also how we think about software, how we model it? I can't wait to hear what you all think of this new model and approach to software delivery, this replacement of the SDLC. I'm excited to see how it changes and adapts to all the scenarios we face in software development and how engineers in every role and at every organization tailor it to meet their specific constraints and challenges. I believe that this is just the revolution to get us started. Thank you so much for having me.